Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Nsala and I want to start by saying thank you very much for clicking on this video. I hope you're all doing well during this time and yeah, so please don't forget to click uh, on the notification bell. Please subscribe and click on the notification bell and then also giving this video a thumbs up if you care. It really helps me a lot when you do that. So yeah. Someone said I jump too fast in my cases, but what else do you want me to say? I'm not a very talkative, I think I am. But yeah, <laughs> so yeah, let's jump into today's case. So today we'll be talking about the unsolved murder of Magdalena Stoffels. So this case took place or happened in Namibia, in the capital city, Vanduk. Magdalena was 17 years old at the time of her death and she was the middle child, the only girl, the only daughter in the family. She had an older brother and a younger brother. She was really close to her family, especially her older brother. They had a really tight bond and her mother said that she was doing well in school. She was doing her grade 11 and she looked to be having a bright future actually. She was described as a very bubbly girl bright personality, really loved people, loved talking a lot, she loved music, dancing, she loved cooking and decorating. Her mom said that she planned or hoped in the future that she would be able to own like a beauty parlor or any type of events business or you know just that creative field basically and yeah she really loved doing that type of stuff. She attended David Besedinot High School, which is located in Komasdal, and she also lived in Komasdal. So she didn't live far from where she schooled, and so she didn't have to be probably dropped off or picked up every day. She could walk to school, and that's what she always did. So to walk to David Besedinot, there were two routes she could take. Either the main long route, which is really, really long, but I think for where she lived, it was easier for her to take the riverbed to take it was really bushy and there was a river there and a lot of like tall trees and stuff like that so it was easier for her to take that shortcut and there wasn't any mapped out road or you know a route that people could really take but everybody took this it was the lazier way and it meant that she could sleep in and didn't have to wake up super early you know she could leave and know that it wouldn't take too long for her to get to school so she was doing a grade 11 and on that day, which is the 27th of uh, July 2010, she went to school but then had to leave early because she wasn't feeling well. So she left school early and took her normal route, which is the shortcut, the riverbed. But this riverbed was very unsafe and people just took it, you know, you went there, you walked there knowing that it was a risk. but. There had not been any major crimes or situations that had happened there, so people just took it, you know, took the risk. And on that day when she went home, it's very unclear, it wasn't reported as to how she was found, but she was found on the 27th of July 2010. She was found alive and then died shortly after. She had been found with a slit throat and defensive wounds all over her body. She had been brutally murdered plus raped. And the crazy thing is that not too far from where her body was found, they found a man named Junius Philippus. And he had been covered basically with blood. He had been washing his clothes in the river and had his knees were scraped up and had a lot of scratch marks on his back. So when a police officer who had, they had been patrolling the area, basically walking around, just looking if they could find any information, any evidence that would help the case, that's when they found him and immediately took him into police custody because it was really suspicious as to what he was doing there. And there's a girl not too far away from you who has just been murdered and you are here cleaning yourself of the blood and you, you know you have marks all over you which they probably thought is marks which Magdalena caused because she was trying to defend herself and get away from her attacker. So he was taken into police custody awaiting you know interrogation and just for the investigation to commence. And the crazy part which is actually what I don't understand is I saw in one of the articles and I'm not too sure if this is very reliable because it was only in one of the articles where I saw this where 
Philippus actually claimed that he had found Magdalena's um, Magdalena's body there, basically her half life, half half dead, and when he found her there, she was already you know in the situation she was in, so he hadn't caused the the injuries or slit her throat or you know attempted to murder her. But he found her there and then walked away and decided to go clean himself because he tried helping her but saw that she was dying either way. Which I cannot understand because when the police arrived, they actually found Magdalena still alive but she died shortly after. So if she was still alive and he decided to prioritize cleaning himself and ridding himself of the blood, instead of calling for help or getting help to you know come and save her, probably she could have been saved but there was only one of the sources so I'm not really sure about that account and during this he was actually held in custody he was in police custody for 191 days because after she had been taken for post-mortem examination it took them six days before they could find any true forensic information and like I mentioned she had been raped so there was semen found on her six days later and when they took this semen to be you know matched to Philippa's own semen I don't know why it took them 191 days it's just so bizarre for me that this man was in custody for 191 days that's how long it took them to run these tests like almost a whole like it's crazy so when they did this investigation it actually came back that it wasn't his semen so they basically ruled him out as the suspect because that was the only and major suspect that they had nobody had come in with information or any leads that could help them even though the police had released a reward if there was any reliable or concrete information that could help them with the case and after the 191 days which was in may 2011 he was released and it actually didn't take long for him i think after that it was a uh, 2013 actually when he decided to sue the country the government basically for holding him in custody for so long but it was basically thrown out because it had read the statute of limitations so he couldn't sue the government and, and got nothing but he claimed that it felt as if the government was just looking for someone to pin this case on even though it wasn't him which i don't understand like Poor Magdalena. I cannot imagine what she had gone through in her last moments, in her last minutes, the pain that had been caused to her. Imagine how many years it's been since 2010, now almost 11 years basically, and nothing has been done. They couldn't find her murderer, no information, no leads. It kind of felt to her family like the police were not doing anything. And in one of the interviews her mother had in 2015, she actually said that she didn't really blame the police because they were understaffed. You have police officers and instead of investigators doing the investigating, people who are not trained or skilled in the area to be finding, you know, very complex information or leads, which could be very, very difficult. But her mother said that the family hadn't really gone through any type of therapy or rehabilitation to help them deal with her death and had just been praying to God for help and you know just to help them move on and you know recover from all this and she said actually that she had decided to forgive the murderer whoever it is or wherever it is because being angry will just be hurting her instead however she would love to and keeps praying and hoping that one day they'll be able to catch this person so that they are not out there doing all these different crimes and just probably hurting someone else, another girl. And this has been a really huge major issue, not only in Namibia, but all, all, of, all over the world. Gender-based violence, where in such a situation, someone took advantage of a, a vulnerable schoolgirl and decided to rape and murder her, which was just so unfair. And her family has now been deprived of knowing what she would have been like, what career path she would have taken. You know, her mother doesn't get to hold her grandkids from her daughter. And it's just really sad and really painful the family have to go through this. And I really sympathize with them. And it's just quite unfortunate. And hopefully that she will continue to shine a light on her family. In in a way to sort of rehabilitate herself, her mother began taking in 
orphans or abandoned babies because she felt like her own baby was taken away from her let her help those babies who don't have homes or anyone to love them because she still had so much love to give and wanted to give it to these babies that do not have a home or whose parents are unable to care for them so that was her way of giving back you know and yeah this is basically it for the case no information it's basically gone as a cold case and the the families haven't been told about any new leads or information because they believe there is none and that's it for this case so approximately 3,000 people including school children from 10 schools marched from Magdalena school to the magistrate court in Katutura to protest her rape and murder and also to deliver a petition to the deputy prosecutor general and this petition pointed out the high rate of violent crime on Namibian children and it also brought about the debate of the reinstatement of the death penalty in Namibia and also to celebrate her life in 2013 a pedestrian bridge in Komasdal, where the murder took place, was built and it is situated close to the David Pesedenot High School, where she was a learner. The bridge basically is hoped to prevent future crimes in the bushy riverbed. But also on a side note, I found an article of what happened to Philippus in 2021 this year, which Philippus, remember, is the man who was acquitted of the rape and murder of Magdalena in 2010. And after that, he was arrested this year for allegedly having sex with a goat in the Ohangwena region. So because bestiality is a crime in Namibia, he was held in police custody and was granted a 1,000 Namibian dollar bail grant. But was also reduced now to 300 which he was still unable to pay for so i don't know that just made it so strange for me like who does that it's just a crazy weird thing but yeah that is it um thank you i don't know why that took me so long to say but thank you so much for watching this video i really appreciate your time and my next case is is amazing like i've already been looking into it and it's so crazy so please stay tuned for the next one and i hope you really enjoyed this one and please don't forget the thumbs up and and until next time goodbye and take care